Hey guys, what's up? This is Diego here at Cinema Gun Reviews. Well, we did it. 2021 is officially over. We survived yet another year of chaos. It's been pretty hectic a couple times throughout the year. We've had our ups and downs, but one thing's for sure, it has been a great year for movies. Now with that said, as a way of finishing out the year, I'm here to give you guys my countdown of my top 10 favorite movies of 2021. This countdown is where I just get to be totally subjective and only talk about my favorite movies of the year. Ratings don't matter here. This is just me and my opinion. And just to let you guys know, this is going to contain spoilers for a lot of these movies, if not all. I'm going to play it by ear, so just watch this at your own discretion, okay? Okay, so now that we've gotten this out of the way, let's start this list with some honorable mentions. These are movies that were just spectacular. I love them. 100% would watch them again, but they just didn't quite make the cut for my top 10. Godzilla vs. Kong was one of my most anticipated movies of the year, and let me tell you, it sure didn't disappoint. It had a lot of fun action featuring both Godzilla and Kong, it knew exactly what it needed to be, and it succeeded and didn't hold back at being exactly that. It also avoided the Batman v Superman Martha moment, and gave us a clear winner, twice I might add, Team Godzilla all the way. I just really hope that this isn't the last movie in the franchise, because if it is, man, what a high note they sure left on. Bo Burnham's Netflix film Inside was kind of a unique film for me because I kind of just don't know how to classify it, whether as just a comedy special or a very interesting and introspective look into Bo Burnham's mind. I think what I loved the most about it was just how much work Bo Burnham clearly put into it. The songs were obviously hilarious, the skits that he employed were really funny, but they were also unapologetic and actually very deep with their messages and the introspective nature of them. And in the true Bo Burnham style, I think a lot of people would agree with me that this is his best work yet. Free Guy. That's right, the GTA movie we never knew we wanted until we saw the first trailer. The plot, despite being very much inspired by what we already know, managed to still feel very unique, and actually still had quite a bit to say about being independent and following your own path in life, which I think in the end is what made this movie so memorable. Even despite the noticeable reshoots, including a very hilarious cameo by Chris Evans, I still had a great time with Free Guy and I walked out of the theater feeling good about myself. I can't wait to see what's next for all these characters. Dune was easily the most gorgeously shot film all year, and a movie that I didn't expect to love as much as I did. The production design was as gorgeous as I've ever seen, especially from Denis Villeneuve, the performances were all around spectacular, and the visual effects and the use of scale is honestly immaculate. It's stuff that I have saved as my phone wallpaper, which, look at that, look at that right there. See? In the true style of Denis Villeneuve, this movie manages to make the world feel larger than life and completely immerse you in the story with some very well-directed sci-fi action. I guess my one flaw would be that the ending is a little bit anticlimactic, but even then it still leaves you wanting more, and I can't wait to see more when the sequel comes out. Just like Dune, Luca was a movie that I didn't expect to love as much as I did. And it's not just because of the Pixar animation style, which is beautiful as always. I think Luca was special because ultimately it's a movie about empowerment. I empathize so much with Luca and his journey towards what is ultimately self-acceptance. It's something I learned a long time ago, where you have to accept yourself and love yourself and ignore all the negative things people say about you, as well as the negative thoughts inside your own head. I think that's a very important message, and I think just like Pixar, they nailed it once again. You should definitely see Luca, because this movie will hit you right at home no matter what age you are. And that concludes my honorable mentions, but now we get down to the nitty gritty, which you've all come here to see, so let's kick off my countdown of my top 10 favorite movies of 2021, starting with number 10. Judas and the Black Messiah was a very hard-hitting drama featuring two very intense performances by both Daniel Kaluuya and Lakeith Stanfield. I think this is the best work by both of them that I've ever seen. Kaluuya was so intense as Fred Hampton that I never doubted for a second that I was watching the real guy. I was also deeply immersed in the tension brought on by Bill O'Neill's part of the story. With every scene, we see on Lakeith Stanfield's face how Bill O'Neill is just torn apart by what he's doing and what he wishes he could do. And I was watching in horror the whole time, because it's sad that with regard to the Black Lives Matter movement and the civil rights process that our country's still going through, by the way, that people still have to face repression from their own governments. This was obviously a very important movie, and one that I think everyone should watch. If you believe in Justice for All, and you believe in Black Lives Matter, please see Judas and the Black Messiah. At number 9 we have Till Death, a horror movie starring Megan Fox. This movie stayed under my radar for a really long time before I heard what folks were saying about it, and then I was curious to check it out myself but didn't really have the chance to, until it was finally put on Netflix not too long ago. 
Horror movies like this are rare nowadays. This one takes place mostly in a single location, it's very low budget, and features a few very good performances. To my surprise, this is actually a very good turnout by Megan Fox, and a very interesting mystery surrounding what she's doing there in the first place. Most importantly, I think it sends a very good message about marriage, and how dangerous and toxic it can be when you're married to the wrong person. Which is kind of darkly funny, because for most of the movie, Megan Fox is lugging around a disgusting corpse. Except this one doesn't make music. <laughs> I found myself surprisingly glued to the screen from beginning to end, and I'm actually kind of sad now that more people haven't seen this movie. As for Megan Fox, I kind of wish she'd make movies like this more often. Another good movie of hers that you should watch that's kind of a, a niche horror film is Jennifer's Body. At number 8 we have Encanto. This movie I was really looking forward to and I'm sure glad it was as good as I'd hoped. Me and my girlfriend saw this together and we were just blown away. The story is so sweet, the animation style is so beautiful, the songs were really catchy. I think mine and her favorite number was the one the older sister sings. This movie also has quite a bit of humor and some really heartfelt moments. And you may not think this is any surprise, especially for a Disney movie, but this was actually a very unique story. In fact, much more unique than the animated Disney films I've seen in recent years. The story in Encanto felt very intimate and personal. This is a story about how older generations can inflict pressure on younger generations. It's something that, especially as a Latino, I felt very close to, and a lot of the beats of the story hit very close to home for me. It was actually very well written. I can't wait to see what the animation team at Disney comes up with next, because lately, they've been on quite the roll. At number 7 we have a movie that it took me probably way too long to watch, and it's one of the best westerns I've seen in a long time. The Harder They Fall was a masterfully directed movie, filled with great writing and great performances from everyone. The story was reminiscent of a really good Quentin Tarantino western like Django Unchained or The Hateful Eight. It was a really good slow burn thriller as well, with really gripping messages about family and revenge and the lines we cross to get what we want. Jonathan Majors and Idris Elba are so good in this movie, and where the film really shines is when both of these characters are going up against each other, especially in that finale, which is so intense and brutal and bloody, and it has a really shocking twist that honestly I didn't even see coming. I'm really happy that Netflix movies have gotten this good recently. I hope we see more Netflix movies like this for a long time. The Suicide Squad was an absolute blast. James Gunn wrote and directed his best film, I think, since the first Guardians of the Galaxy, and it truly shows. It wasn't just the fun and entertaining story, but also its surprisingly excellent use of characters, not the least of which are John Cena as Peacemaker, Margot Robbie as Harley Quinn, among many, many others. There were some surprisingly satisfying arcs in this movie as well, not the least of which was King Shark, whom I was surprised to care about a lot more than I expected to. And just like the best R-rated comic book films, it's full of spectacle, it's bloody as hell, and it's damn entertaining with its action and its comedy. The Suicide Squad was a very big step in the right direction for DC, especially following the 2016 movie, and I really hope James Gunn follows this up with another one. And now we move on to the top 5. And you guys, I just want to say that it took a lot of hard work to get these movies in the order that they are. I spent a lot of time, you know, switching these movies back and forth and deciding how each movie measured up to the others. It was very hard work, it was very difficult, but this is what I came up with. At number 5 we have a movie that I honestly didn't think existed, and if it somehow did exist, I wasn't sure it was going to be any good. But when Zack Snyder's Justice League was released on HBO Max and I finally saw it, I was surprised to find myself actually loving it. It was miles ahead of the Whedon cut, and it did something that I didn't expect it to do. It not only blew all my expectations out of the water, it also became my favorite DC Comics movie since The Dark Knight. I'm not exaggerating you guys, I've actually given this a lot of thought. I loved what they did with the characters, the story felt complex, it was deep with its themes of faith and believing in yourself, the characters all felt three dimensional, the villains had relatable motivations despite the obviously terrible things they were trying to do, and honestly a lot of these action scenes felt iconic. At this point, it's safe to say that I'm on Zack Snyder's side. It would be a real shame if we never saw a sequel to the Snyder Cut, because if it turned out to be as good as this one was, then isn't that worth advocating for? At number 4, it might not be a surprise to any of you guys that are Marvel movies on this list, but I loved 
And I mean, I absolutely loved Shang-Chi and the Legend of the Ten Rings. This was easily one of my favorite solo movies in the MCU, and probably one of my favorite superhero movies of recent years. It has so much to offer in terms of what it adds to the MCU, and not just with its story, but also with the characters. These are some of the best characters I've ever seen in a solo Marvel movie. Simu Liu as Shang-Chi, but also Tony Leung as Wenwu, and even Aquafina as Katie. And this story has some of the best visuals I've seen in a solo Marvel movie. The visual effects, the cinematography, the use of color was all so great. This is a very pretty looking movie. I've seen Shang-Chi in theaters twice now and I've loved it both times. I'm so glad that Avengers Endgame was not the end of it for Marvel. The future looks very bright indeed and I can't wait to see where the story takes us next. At number three, this is probably going to be the first animated movie to ever crack my top three favorite films of the year. This is a movie that, for the record, I expected to hate, but Sebastian seemed to love this movie, and it made me curious enough to check it out. And sure enough, I did, and I had an absolute blast watching The Mitchells vs. The Machines. This wasn't just the best animated Netflix movie, but one of the best animated films I've seen in a while. The animation style was fresh, the voice work was quirky and unique, and the story was surprisingly heartwarming. It was also extremely hilarious. There was a point in this movie where I was having such a good time that I honestly didn't know who my favorite character was. Because every time I thought the movie reached its peak with humor, every time I thought a character had the best joke or the best moment, the movie just kept surprising me. Yet at the same time, all that humor and excitement doesn't interfere with the heartwarming nature of the story at the center of the film. This is a movie about reconnecting with family and the fear of when someone leaves the nest and you're worried that things aren't going to be the same with them ever again. I was actually really invested in it. You know, I'm almost sad that this movie won't have a sequel, but at the same time there's this odd sense of closure that the movie gives you at the end. It was a little bittersweet, but I don't know, something about it just works. At number two, we had another movie that I was looking forward to seeing this year, and I'm glad it didn't disappoint. In the Heights was a movie that I loved from beginning to end. The sounds of the music and the way it's composed, excellent as ever, by the way, by Lin-Manuel Miranda, just reminded me of when I was growing up in Puerto Rico. It made me very nostalgic. I was honestly smiling for a lot of those scenes because I remember being in those environments a lot of times and being in those situations. I mean, I could almost smell the hairspray in that salon. The characters were three-dimensional and relatable, and the performances by Anthony Ramos and Corey Hawkins and the rest of the cast were just all-around spectacular. I was laughing, I was nodding along to the beat of the songs, and I was just having a blast with it. Now, let it be said that I know this movie received a lot of criticism, which Sebastian already touched on in his review, and I completely agree with that it's wrong. I'm not trying to be insensitive to that. Once again, this is just my takeaway from the film. I loved In the Heights, and even despite all that, I still think it's a well-made musical. So now we've arrived at number one, and you might not be surprised to see this on this list, or even at number one. I know a lot of you guys might probably already know what it is. Uh, some of you may be disappointed. There were a lot of movies that I didn't see this year that obviously didn't make it onto this list. And look, for the record, I just want to say I'm sure they were all great. Uh, I just haven't seen them. And even if I did, let me just be completely biased because this is a top 10 countdown and say that I don't think my opinion would change much even if I had seen them. Now with that being said, my number one favorite film of 2021 is... Spider-Man No Way Home. What can I say you guys, this movie blew all my expectations out of the water and it gave me things that I didn't even know I wanted to see. I mean, for example, Andrew Garfield helping Tobey Maguire out with his back problems. Or even a surprising redemption arc for both Andrew and Tobey. I'm just glad that they didn't show up as like a cheap five second cameo where they say a line and then they just swing off into the distance. Because let me be clear, I might have actually thrown something at the theater screen if that happened. This movie hit all the right notes with me. I laughed, I cried, I gasped, and I smiled in awe at everything that I was seeing. This is Tom Holland's best work as Spider-Man, and the way this movie ends, I'm glad that we're getting to see more of him in the future. More importantly, the MCU has succeeded in giving us the best solo Spider-Man movie ever. I'm not exaggerating, I still stand by my point that this movie was better than Spider-Man 2. This was a very satisfying film, and the way that it ends, I'm really hoping that we get to see a lot more of Spider-Man in the future. And from what I hear, we might be seeing a lot more of Andrew Garfield and Tobey Maguire as well, so fingers crossed for that. The MCU has proven now more than ever that anything is possible, and I am 100% on board for whatever's next. And with that concludes my top 10 favorite movies of 2021. Now, I know what some of you guys might be thinking at this point, where's Pig? Where's Spencer? Where's Last Night in Soho? And I've already said before that I'm sure those movies are probably great, I wouldn't know personally because I haven't seen them, but once again, No Way Home was my favorite movie this year, it hit all the right notes for me, 
And honestly, I don't think my opinion would change even if I had seen the rest of those movies. Oh, your opinion is trash. Well, in that case, I'll say to you that you're a wonderful human being, and I hope that you're very happy and successful in life. Anyway, I just want to take this time to say thank you guys so much for supporting Cinema Again Reviews this year. We've been very happy with the success this channel has had, and we hope to see you guys again with us next year in 2022. There are a lot of good shows and movies to look forward to next year, and Sebastian and I are looking forward to giving you guys our thoughts on all of them, so we want to wish you a very Merry Christmas or a Happy Holidays and a Happy New Year. Now, as always, be sure to like this video and subscribe, follow us on Facebook and Twitter, and please support our Patreon, we really appreciate that. Thank you guys so much for watching, this is Diego for Cinemageddon Reviews, and I'll see you on the Wasteland.